All right, uh, so we will get going. Uh, welcome to the fifth in this series, I think, of the of the Center for Science of Moral Understanding talk series. We're very uh, thrilled to have Paul Bloom here to talk with us today. Paul is, uh, as of a week ago, professor of psychology at the University of Toronto, um, and has done, you know, it feels funny introducing Paul because uh, everyone's probably aware of his amazing contributions. He's like one of the founding pillars, really, of moral psychology and um, ha has just done remarkable, amazing work consistently for, uh, uh, for as long as I've known about his research, which is my entire career. In fact, Descartes' Baby was one of the first books I read in grad school and it kind of blew my mind. Uh, and, and it really made me understand kind of like the power of um, mind perception and, and how our perceptions of other minds are not um, really in tune with reality in a lot of ways. So, uh, we're very excited to have him here today, where he will be giving his talk uh, entitled Men Against Fire. So take away, Paul. And, and Paul, I should say that we let speakers dictate the, the norm. So you can take questions as we go. We can wait till the end, whatever you'd prefer. Great. Thank you. Um, do you have a picture of a building in front of you and you hear my voice? Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, so um, thanks, thanks so much for, for inviting me here. Um, this is University of Toronto from Google Images and, uh, and it's now my new home. And I'm partially saying that because um, I know there's a lot of undergraduates <clears throat> in this room and I'm very much looking for new graduate students for next year. And also, I'm also have an eye out for some postdocs. Uh, so, so if you're interested, please, uh, please get in touch with me. Um, I'll also say uh, this is going to be a somewhat unusual presentation that's going to be on a short side. Um, I just got I have some ideas I, I wanted to um, to to talk about. And so I won't I'll just kind of go through it, but it'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, and then um, also it's going to be a very data light uh, presentation. There's a lot of ideas, a lot of theory. And, but there'll be only one slide, there'll only be one slide with graphs and the graphs are actually from work from uh, Emily Gurdon, who I'm delighted to see is here. So she'll answer any questions about them during the question period. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see, there we go. Um, some of you might be familiar with a British uh, TV show uh, called Black Mirror that um, presents dystopian uh, views of the future. And in one of their episodes that has gotten a lot of discussion in social media and elsewhere is called Men Against Fire. And Men Against Fire depicts something in the near future. And it's a story of a soldier named Stripe. And in this future, the earth has been attacked and is overrun by, by aliens, by monsters. And Stripe's job is to kill them. And so he's doing that, his life is going well as a soldier. But then he makes a sort of shocking discovery by accident. Um, and the discovery is that these people, that these aliens who he was killing aren't really aliens, they're people. Um, and in fact, he has an implant in his head that takes people and makes them see, make, makes him see them as monstrous. And when they talk, he hears them as if they're making these hideous, terrible cries. And this implant has been put into his head by the government to make the soldiers more efficient at their acts of, of uh, ethnic cleansing. And after he discovers this, um, the wonderful character actor, Michael Kelly, plays a, a psychiatrist who then explains to him what's going on, why the implants were put in there in the first place. So he says, humans, you know, we give ourselves a bad rap, but we're generally empathic as a species. I mean, we don't actually really want to kill each other, which is a good thing, until your future depends on wiping out the enemy. I don't know how much history you studied in school. Many years ago, I'm talking early 20th century, most soldiers didn't even fire their weapons. Or if they did, they would just aim over the heads of the enemies. They did it on purpose. British Army, World War I. The brigadier, he'd walk the line with a stick and he'd whack his men in order to get them to shoot. Even in World War II, in a firefight, only 15, 20% of the men would pull the trigger. Fate of the world at stake and only 15% open fire. Now, what does that tell you? It tells me that that war would have been over a whole lot quicker if the military got its shit together. 
And what he means is the military figured out some way to stop the natural reluctance of its soldiers to kill. The statistics um, of men um, not fighting their weapons in World War II were from uh, uh, Marshall in a, a book, Men Against Fire, which presumably the Black Mirror episode took his title from. And Men Against Fire is devoted to solving the problem of battle command. And the problem of battle command, according to Marshall, is that soldiers in battle tend to think of, their, of, of the people they're fighting as people. And so the problem is how do you get, get them to override that? And the solution for Marshall is get them to think of other people, those, pe those people as not people at all. The solution, in other words, is uh, dehumanization. And dehumanization is, is a notion used very much in moral psychology and in social psychology and in the world at large. And it has a lot of meanings. So on one extreme, there's the idea proposed by David Livingston Smith in several books, including another book that's, that's about to come out. And Smith argues that when we dehumanize, we literally see others as non-human. To dehumanize a, another person, he writes, is to conceive of them as a subhuman animal. And he's very clear, this is not a metaphor. He says, in acts of slavery and genocide, mass extermination, ethnic cleansing, typically the perpetrators literally see the people they're dealing with as non-human or subhuman. On the other extreme, dehumanization is also used sometimes for a lot of milder things like treating people without proper respect. So if you see that, um, that, that when you hit an airline, airplane travel is dehumanizing, there's a sense in which it means people are not treated properly. Nobody thinks that airlines are purposefully making people suffer in order to demean them or because they think of them as not human. They're doing it to make, to save money but it has sort of a dehumanizing effect. Most social psychologists and moral psychologists who talk about dehumanization have something in between in mind. Um, they're talking about a certain way of thinking about other individuals and other groups as not fully human. And this could cash out in different ways. So sometimes this means denying uh, uh, people some general psychological uh, psychological traits. So a lot of his work draws upon, upon Professor Gray's work, which, is, which talks about the fact that we, we imbue people typically with both agency and patiency to dehumanize them is to take away from that. You might liken people to non-human animals. So one way to think about this, which is the way it's often operationalized, is that there are certain feelings or emotions or affective states that we think humans possess and other animals possess, like pain and pleasure. But there's others that are sort of seen as second order, sophisticated uh, emotions like um, contempt and optimism. And we, we think that people have them, we think animals don't have them, and we think that certain other groups, the groups we dehumanize, don't have them either. You might um, deny uh, traits like individuality and warmth. So Haslam talks about a certain uh, type of dehumanization involving a denial of human nature where you feel that person, the first one is, is, uh, is uh, the first two are reverse coded. So you deny people's open-mindedness, that's dehumanizing them, you deny their emotionality. Maybe you see them as superficial, mechanical, or cold. Now, seeing this way, dehumanization is a theory of broad scope. And I'll quote from the very first paragraph of a wonderful review article. Outraged members of the public call sex offenders animals, the poor are mocked as libidinous dolts, Passersby look through homeless people as if they were transparent obstacles. Dementia sufferers are represented in the media as shuffling zombies. Degrading pornographers depict women as mindless, brunatic objects. Exhausted doctors view their patients as inert bodies. And all of these people get dehumanized. If, if, if you haven't been dehumanized yet, your time will come. So, and, and the idea has left formal academia as part of how we naturally talk about things and think about things. A lot of the discourse during the Trump era was complaints about the extent to which um, supporters of Donald Trump were dehumanizing other people, <clears throat> often met with responses that liberals were dehumanizing Donald Trump and his allies. And Twitter, of course, has gotten involved where they had a, a couple of years ago, they put a policy in place concerning dehumanizing speech. And I admire how well they get the psychology here. 
dehumanizing language would treat others less than human. It could, when you deny them human qualities, animalistic dehumanization, or when denied your human nature, mechanistic dehumanization. And so they give some examples, um, describing a religious group as maggots, describing some gender as only good for sex is dehumanizing and hence forbidden by, um, by Twitter policies. What I wanna suggest to you, I'm gonna raise the idea here and explore this a bit. It's first I wanna think that dehumanization happens and it often has terrible consequences. David Livingston Smith in his books gives some extremely vivid descriptions of people very seriously doubting that other groups of people were human. Honestly saying to one another, I think those people are subhuman animals and meaning it. And there's many cases where this, this shows up in action. In um, about a hundred years ago, not much beyond that, um, there were human zoos. Zoos in Europe, as well as in Asia, where they kept people, often children from other countries and exhibited them along with other animals. This seems like honest to God dehumanization. I don't doubt that it occurs. But I wanna argue that some of our ugliest actions and worst attitudes towards outgroups do not reflect dehumanization. In fact, they involve an appreciation of focus and focus on others as people. And I wanna point out that these ideas are not original to me. Um, uh, two philosophers, uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah and Kate Mann, I made this case in detail and I draw upon their work. And just as I was ready to write a big article, uh, trying to get a big article published, uh, sharing my insights with the psychological community, Harriet Over wrote exactly that article somewhat better than I would have. And I'm slowly coming to forgive her. So, so the, I, the critique of dehumanization is not, and these ideas that are about to come out are not, are not unique to me. So here's how the critique goes of the dehumanization goes. Cruelty seems to be um, an argument against the dehumanization theme. And Appiah puts this kind of nicely. So he talks about various uh, uh, cruelties and he says, the persecutors may liken the objects that are enmity to cockroaches and or germs, standard dehumanizing talk, but they acknowledge their victim's humanity in the very act of humiliating, stigmatizing, reviling and torturing them. So he talks about the show trials of the Stalin era, era, where people were brought up, made to confess to crimes that they know they didn't do, everyone else knows they didn't do, but made to debase themselves by, by confessing to crimes. There's all of the degradations and humiliations done to the Jews in the years leading up to the Holocaust, and of course, during the Holocaust itself. Um, during Mao's cultural revolution, um, teachers and intellectuals were humiliated. And Appiah says, look, we don't do that to cockroaches. We don't do that to animals. We do that to people because A, it reflects a wish to make them suffer. And B, it reflects an acknowledgement of their humanity. And the argument could be made, I think, I think reasonably so, that a lot of the things that people point out suggest it's dehumanization, actually suggest quite the opposite. So Smith's excellent book begins with this sentence, come on dogs. And these are uh, uh, taunts by um, Israeli soldiers to Palestinian kids. And so Smith says, look, they're calling them dogs, they're dehumanizing them, they're not thinking of them as human. But I once had a dog and I didn't call the dog dog. I didn't try to, I didn't taunt it by calling it a dog. You don't taunt a dog by calling it a dog. You taunt a human by calling it. By, by calling them a dog. Another case is in, um, in, in some soccer games, racist fans will throw, uh, will throw bananas at players of African descent and make and hoot and make monkey sounds. But it's not because they literally think that they're monkeys, rather it's because they know that they're people. And this is just a, a real ugly thing to do to people. And if you wanna hurt somebody, that's one way to do it. So, so Kate Mann makes this point regarding the dog comment. She, she points out, this is an insult that depends for its humiliating quality on its target's distinctively human desire to be recognized as human beings. This is how it gets to be a taunt. More generally, a lot of the actions we do to others and our responses to others reflect a recognition of morality and agency. 
And you see this actually in this, in this great paper by Forscher and Catelli. And I know Catelli came and talked to this group a little while ago. So they used their sort of blatant dehumanization scale to figure out what the alt-right, how the alt-right would evaluate different groups. And I'll show you their data. So these are their evaluations of, um, of different groups. These are the ones, the whole range. And I'll zoom in on, the, on the, the bottom half of the scale where people, where the slider indicates the humanness of this people. You see, Jews are dehuman, are, are by the standard considered less than human, dehumanized. Government employees, Republicans who refuse to vote for Trump. Um, journalists, at the very bottom, Hillary Clinton. But I wanna suggest that the, at, the overall attitudes of the alt-right towards these individuals and towards these groups, it's not that they think of them literally as subhuman animals or less than human, rather they think of them as really bad people. The, the rhetoric uh, regarding Hillary Clinton is she belongs in prison. She's done terrible things and should be punished. And that's not an attitude you have towards something that's not human. That's an attitude that's explicitly reserved to people with, with human-like qualities. Um, the attitude towards Jews does not reflect the dismissal of Jews as subhuman. Rather, it reflects, as in the slogan, you will not replace us, a deep anxiety and fear that they're losing what they have to this opposing group. This is man talking more generally about, about, about the phenomena for why, when we see other people as human, they could be so threatening. So she writes, in being capable of rationality, agency, autonomy, and judgment, they are also someone who could coerce, manipulate, humiliate, or shame you. In being capable of abstract relational thought and congruent moral emotions, they are capable of thinking ill of you and regarding you contemptuously. In being capable of forming complex desires and intentions, they're capable of harboring malice and plotting against you. The humanity of other people is, is often an extraordinary threat to us. And all of this involves then an appreciation and focus on others as people. So what about all the data? What about all the data suggesting that when you ask people about opposing groups, um, ethnic minorities, um, uh, various other forms of outgroups, I mean, sexual outgroups, bad people, they rank them lower in all sorts of ways. Well, I have two general remarks here. One general remark is a theme developed, uh, which Emily Gurdon is developing an ongoing work, which is what these scales often try to do. And you know, the, the, the people I'm talking about are aware that there's a problem here. So they want to try to do is zoom in on people's humanity. So that if you rank them low on the scales, you're ranking them low on humanity. The problem is when you look at the items, things that indicate high humanity correspond to other traits that we see as positive. Um, so in, in some ongoing work, Emily finds, gets people to rate traits on humanity, also gets people to rate separately traits on how positive they are, as well as, um, as regarding as traits on morality. And what you could see in here are the graphs I wanted to show you from, from Emily's work. You get a really, really, really high correlation. And so you don't know when people say, oh, that group or that person, I'm gonna scale them as less than human, whether the, 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 the low scores they get ex explicitly and uh, specifically indicate a judgment about those human uh, person's humanity, as opposed to a judgment about all sorts of other things related to humanity. And often what you find is, and I think the primary solution, sorry, the primary um, finding of a lot of this research is we do tend to think less of some people and some groups of people. We think some people are unintelligent, unkind, out of control, cold. But this is very old news. You know, we used to call this prejudice. And it's fully consistent with seeing others as people. Honestly, I think some of my colleagues at Yale, you know, well, some of them have some of those traits. I don't think of them as less than um, less than human. I just think that they're they're people with certain certain flaws. And finally, let's go back to cruelty. So cruelty involves, as we talked about, an acknowledgement of others' humanity. But let's go a bit deeper and say, why are we cruel in the first place? What motivates this cruelty? And there's different answers. And I want to just 
quickly focus on two. Um, one is punishment. So, so I actually do occasional research. And if I was to give a talk about research, I would talk about my work on, um, on intuitions about fairness and, and empathy and sociality and point out that a lot of research, my own lab but others as well, suggests that these moral designers manifest themselves in ways that are often cruel. And in particular, um, part of being a moral being is you wanna punish people who are bad. And a lot of you wanna make, and often you don't wanna punish them just in some sort of instrumental sense to make them less likely to do what they're doing. You wanna make them suffer. And this is a, a, a fairly universal human desire, which might even show up to some degree or another in young children. This point is made earlier by Fisk and, and Rye in their book, Virtuous Violence, where they point out that a lot of the violence we do to, to each other, really cruel, rotten things, isn't due to not thinking of them as human. It's not due to a loss of control. It's not due to a desire to get some instrumental goals. Rather, it's because we think they were doing bad things and we're not gonna punish them. And in fact, our violence isn't something we're ashamed of. We're proud of it. We're doing good things here. Um, historically, this manifests itself in many ways. There's a wonderful book by Andrea Pitzer, if you're interested in evil, I recommend it, called One Long Night, which is a history of concentration camps. And she points out that concentration camps emerge for different reasons. Sometimes they emerge actually to shelter some population against predation from the majority. Sometimes they're there for security reasons, but often they exist in a punitive way as, as an expression of a wish to make some group of people uh, suffer. And so the classic example here is Nazi Germany. So at the end of World War I, German, the German soldiers were of course defeated and they ended up in what were then called concentration camps in Britain. Um, and the, the, the governments of Austria and Germany were particularly slow to demand their release. And there was a lot of resentment about this. And some of the people who failed to demand their release were Jewish, were Jewish leaders. And Hitler commented on that. And one of his earlier speeches before the first concentration camp was built uh, in Germany or Poland, Hitler said, the Jews should learn how it feels to live in concentration camps. There's punishment and then there's domination. And we don't talk enough about this in, in moral psychology, but we're, we're hierarchical creatures. We're, um, we, 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 we seek, we don't wanna be at the bottom of things. We wanna be on the top or at least we wanna be, be pretty high up. And this is not necessarily a sinister thing. Um, this motivates all sorts of pro-social behavior, it motivates all sorts of accomplishment. The desire to be thought well of um, is not necessarily a bad desire. But sometimes we wanna dominate. Sometimes it's not good enough to be respected. We wanna be feared, we wanna dominate, and we might wanna humiliate others. And um, this shows itself in all sorts of ways. And, and it shows itself often in, in the worst atrocities. One, um, one scholar of the Third Reich wrote, talking about the atrocities of Holocaust, what might look like the dehumanization of the other is instead a way to exert power over another human. And this analysis is also extended away from sort of group atrocities towards, you know, everyday, sort of everyday evil we, we see. So um, Roxane Gay was commenting on uh, uh, Harvey Weinstein's crimes and describing how weird they were and how sort of, arbitrarily cruel some of his actions were. And she writes, there's a sexual component, yes, but mostly it's about someone exerting his or her will over another and deriving pleasure and satisfaction from that exertion. So who cares? Like there, there's all this great work that's falling under the rubric of dehumanization. And I think a lot of it is great work. So who cares whether it is in some sort of proper explicit way, really dehumanization. Well, I think there's two reasons to care and I'll end with this. The first is if everything's dehumanization, nothing's dehumanization. If the term is applied so broadly as to include everything, then we might lose an intellectual 
grasp and a moral grasp of the unique horrible aspects of dehumanization. I think this is dehumanization. I think there's a good case to be made. But the people who are reviewing the literature and talking about dehumanization include so much. So I'll, here's a study. It's a very, very nice study. Um, and a study suggests that, um, that um, when you're listening to somebody, you think that they're more thoughtful and more appealing than if you simply read the same words they have that are, that are written down. I think that's a really cool result. But I'm constantly surprised to hear this put under the rubric of dehumanization. For me to think of somebody as less thoughtful, opposed to more thoughtful, seems like a really interesting thing that could involve how I treat them. But to think of somebody as less thoughtful than they otherwise would be seems in no strong sense to count as dehumanization. I worry we lose too much if we, if we put it under that category. Um, I think a proper way to think about moral psychology and a proper way to think about all the, all the shit we do to each other um, is, to, is to say there's a lot of different factors. There's dehumanization. Honest to God dehumanization, where you think of somebody in some interesting sense as not fully human. But there's also what I talked about here, moral punishment, dominance. And there's other things besides. Sometimes we do cruel things to people because we have instrumental goals. We want something they have, they're in our way. Sometimes um, there's obedience. Milgram was not entirely mistaken. Some atrocities are because other people tell us to do them and we obey. Finally, there's just a little loss of control. Um, an enormous number of violent crimes are done under the influence of alcohol and other drugs. Under some estimates, when it comes to sort of crimes, putting aside war and everything, you've got a number of over half. This isn't because something about alcohol makes you see people as subhuman animals. It's because alcohol diminishes your inhibitions. And so your anger, your rage, your humiliation get free play. The second reason um, to take seriously and criticize seriously the dehumanization claim is because I think it suggests the wrong way to think about evil. Both the Black Mirror episode and the book it was based on conceptualize evil as a mistake. It's either a mistake that, that we want to avoid, or maybe it's a mistake we want to sort of get people to believe, we want them to do bad things, but it's a mistake, it's a confusion. And if things were cleared up, if the implant was removed from our heads, we'd finally recognize we're really dealing with people. And as such, we wouldn't be so, so terrible to them. I think this itself is a mistake. I think it's a mistake historically. People have pointed out that Marshall's famous claim about, uh, his soldiers shooting bullets over, over the heads of the enemy or not firing bullets at all was almost certainly a mistake and, and most likely given a very many conflicting reports he gave about interviews a fabrication. There's no evidence that people in battle are particularly loath to kill. And since then, since, since Vietnam, um, people are thinking that the analysis may be entirely wrongheaded. Similarly, the analysis of the Holocaust, that it was due to simple dehumanization or obedience, as Milgram has it, is at best incomplete. Um, a lot of the most horrible atrocities were done by people who were enthusiastic about it, who did it because they wanted to do it and were not ashamed. I think the proper analysis um, of, of cruelty and evil involves some very bad news, which is that it's not based on a mistake, it's not based on a confusion, it's based on an acknowledgement of others' humanity. And we want to acknowledge other people's humanity. People are human. And all of the goodness we see regarding each other stems from this acknowledgement. But unfortunately, a lot of the evil too. And this makes the problems of cruelty and evil, I think, particularly hard to solve. But if that's true, it's worth knowing. And I will start with that. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, surely some questions to, to pop up, very thought provoking. Um, I'll, I'll maybe kick off with, with one question. Yeah. Um, you presented a kind of right dichotomy in some sense, like there's, there's dehumanization, we don't see a human mind, and then there's 
not dehumanization, right? We humanize them and that's one reason why we wanna punish them um, because you recognize their evil humanity. And I think the examples you bring up definitely support that view, but I'm thinking of, a, of another kind of agent in the Holocaust and that's Eichmann, right? Who, yeah. who really just managed train tables and a logistics yeah. problem or, you know, folks who, who repaired maybe the, the gas chambers, right? Or, or surgeons who, who only see a little sliver yes. uh, of a body yes. when they operate. So, right, you, you could imagine kind of appreciating someone's humanity and a, and a motivation to, to want to hurt them. But when it comes to maintaining those behaviors uh, or to enacting them en masse, one could imagine that dehumanization is present, useful, necessary. I'm not sure what you think. I, I agree. I, I, I agree with the general point and I agree with the specific example. Eichmann was a problem solver. He was a, a bureaucrat. He, he, knew, he knew many Jews. He had nothing against them, he would always say. Some of his best friends were. And, and, but he, um, and he probably, when, when enacting his atrocities, didn't think of them as people at all. He shifted. And I think there really is a time course where Sometimes, for instance, what happens is atrocities, and this may well fit the Nazi case, atrocities are committed in moral enthusiasm. They deserve it. And then people look back on what they did and they are ashamed. And then after their shame, and there, there's, there's sort of narrative reports of this, they say, well, they weren't people at all. They weren't people, so what we did didn't matter that much. I think, I think that you look at something as big as the Holocaust and there are clearly cases where active dehumanization goes on. There are clear cases where um, moralistic punishment goes on, obedience goes on and pulling them apart is a really worthwhile goal. And you're right as well, it's not just sort of a variety and different motivations, it's a time course. You could start to do something moralistically and shift to dehumanization later. And, uh, and so I, I, I agree. It's one I've I've been accused in other cases of having sort of strong views. So you know, against empathy and so on. Here, my view I think is is pleasingly um, uh, flexible. Where I would not deny for a sec that real dehumanization goes on. Great, thanks, Paul. Uh, I, I can field questions, or or you can yeah, you, field you, questions. You you field you field. All right, okay, I'll, I'll try to keep track. Uh, I think it was Eli, then Paul, then Tristan. Hey, uh, Dr. Bloom, uh, very fun, uh, engaging talk. Um, nice I had a question you, about, Rich. yeah, it's good to see you. I, I had a question about the intersection of dehumanization and objectification and instrumentality. Um, and what's interesting to me is, is there was a, a, a terrific um, student here in the management group at Kellogg um, who took my PhD seminar on relationships. And we talk a lot about instrumentality um, how important it is in a relationship that that people help us achieve our goals, that we help them achieve their goals. Um, and he uh, is an Adam Waite student who said, "Wait a minute, <laughs> um, how does instrumentality differ from objectification?" Hey Ben, 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 you got to chill out. Sorry, my eight-year-old is very excited about something related to presumably Star Wars. Instrumentality. Um, yeah, he was he was um, anti-instrumental to my current goals. So um, uh, so. so he and I have had a bunch of conversations. We haven't ended up doing that much with this, but but um, it seems like the core of at least objectification is yeah. instrumentality. That is using somebody for some instrumental goal. Like for example, maybe you want to be with somebody because she's funny or, or good in bed or whatever it is. Yeah. And I just have not been able to wrap my head around the fact that there are these literatures that tell precisely opposite stories about whether being a tool, if we prefer that word, towards somebody else's goals is a good thing or a bad thing. I know this is a little tangential to what you're dealing with here, but I think is related to objectification, perhaps also to dehumanization. I'd love to hear your riffing on that, if you're willing to do that. Riff, I will. Um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful issue. I think under most analyses, you could see objectification as a subtype of dehumanization. It's often treated that way. So the objectification is often talked in the, sex, about in the sexual realm. And, but in some of them, when people talk about it, and, and you notice that uh, Haslam and Lohman kind of have it in about pornographers, it would be treating 
one group of people, typically men, treating another group of, of people, uh, typically women, as mere bodies, as, as, as objects, as, as instrumental means for pleasure. Um, and you could see all sorts of ways. So here's the riff. You see all sorts of ways in which that's wrong. Um, people want to be treated as people. Um, and certainly if treating somebody instrumentally involves disrespecting their rights or their autonomy. It's plainly wrong. But then it gets complicated. So Martha Nussbaum has written, I think, more thoughtfully about objectification than anybody else. And she says, sometimes it could be good. Suppose I work out a lot and I want my partner to respect my physique and sort of look at me as a body. That's okay as long as I have my consent and my autonomy. Suppose Nussbaum gives the example that her partner is sleeping in bed and, she, and while he's sleeping, she gently rests her head on his stomach to prop it up while she's reading. Well, she's using him as an object. You know, if a pillow, pillow was handy, she'd go to that. But assuming consent and autonomy, it's okay. And finally, and, and um, Kurt mentioned this sort of talking about things in passing, it could be argued that people like surgeons have to objectify in order to do their job. So, Objectification in certain ways calls into the question the idea of whether it's always immoral to at least in some ways see somebody instrumentally as an object. And I just riffed a little bit, but it's a deep question. It's fundamentally a Kantian question where Kant says, don't treat people as a means to an end. And I'm thinking, I can't call an Uber driver. And then Kant would say, we well, could call an Uber driver, but you got to think of him, acknowledge he's more than just an Uber driver, more than a machine to get you from one place to another. And, and the moral issues are really complicated. Thank you. All right, next up, and Paul, you know, I don't know if you remember, but we have a paper on uh, on pornography and objectification arguing. I do. Um, yeah. Um, I do, and I'm trying, I, if you want to, if you want to riff on that, I, that'd be great. I, no, I, I, all I want to say is that if you have pornography in any of your MTurk studies, it, it goes much, much quicker than a typical MTurk study. Um, that's the that's the hot tip on getting your participants quickly. Apparently, that's the internet. If, All if, right. I, if I go to my bookshelf behind me, oh, that's actually a Zoom bookshelf, but I have a real bookshelf behind me. Um, you will see the book that we use to create our stimuli in that pornography study. <laughs> yeah, you can email us after if you want to know what that book is. No judgment. Um, next up, we've got uh, Paul uh, and then Tristan. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was great. I'm going to try and be quick so that other more interesting questions can get through. Um, uh, so just like my hot take is kind of um, that almost a, a lot of these things, uh, similar to what, what Kurt was saying, um, occurs when people aren't really thinking about people's humanity. They're not, it's almost like they're not dehumanizing or humanizing. They're not thinking about people's human qualities. Yeah. Um, when Maybe when, when you're driving and, and cut somebody off yeah. or something, it's different when somebody cuts you off and you, and you go and try and cut them off. You, you, you know, you're acknowledging their, their personhood you're trying to punish, but when you just cut someone off, you're not really thinking of them as a person anyway like you're not you're like if 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 you're the passenger just asked you then it's like hey what you know yeah. that was a person that you just cut off then you might think about it but i don't know what um, what do you what do you think about that it's a really interesting question connects the same sort of themes that that Eli was getting at which is that we go through our lives right now and this isn't this is no longer a sort of a critique of anybody we're just kind of kind of riffing but we go through our lives and we deal with all sorts of people we don't really treat as people. I don't really, I don't introduce myself to the Uber driver and try to get to know him. I just want to get from one place to another. And I think we could, we could disagree about whether we should, we should do things differently. But I think we would, everybody would agree, well, that's not terrible. Dehumanization in the real sense we should worry about involves not thinking about somebody as, as a person, as fully human, denying people's humanity, which is different from not paying attention to people's humanity. Most people here, many most people here are psychologists. You do a study with 200 M-Turkers, you don't care about the humanity of each of the M-Turkers. You're gonna actually take their data and collate it. Their individuality is just abstracted away. But that doesn't mean you're denying the humanity. You just don't care about it. And in that context, it's fine not to care about it. So I would distinguish these cases 
you're talking about, Paul, which I think are really important um, from true cases of dehumanization, which have a real immoral tint to them. Thank you. All right, then Tristan, Sarah, then Juliana. Oh, no, no, sorry, Tristan, Meltem, then Sarah, then Juliana. Hi, um, so I'm really curious of the implications of this work for the issue of polarization and specifically like how people approach and view the issue and also like the solutions. Because as you kind of implied at the end, it's almost easier to think of the issue being an issue of dehumanization because then there's a more clear solution. We just emphasize yeah. the humanity of you know your opponents or victims or whomever. Um, you're trying to get to be seen as more human. But if it's not, if the solution isn't emphasizing the humanity, then like, what is it? Um, but yeah. also is like, could this be one of those like psychological findings that we want to like hide from the public because it's going to make them like more hopeless about the situation because instead they're going to view people's, you know, immoral behavior as intentional, enthusiastic acts of cruelty rather than something that could be, you know, um, I've clarified. Um, yeah, I'm just curious what you think about that. Those are great questions. Um, I agree with you about the polarization phenomena, which is I've often, particularly in when Trump was president, I've often heard it said that, oh, Trump supporters dehumanize Democrats and Democrats dehumanize Trump supporters. I actually think they just hate each other. I think it's, it's a lot simpler. They, they, they don't want, they don't think of them as, as, as robots or animals. They want to punch them in the mouth. They, they just, Aid each other. Um, and so how do you solve the problem of polarization? Oh, that's a obvious idea. Should we, should, we, um, should we kind of keep this bad news bottle up? Um, probably not. Um, for one thing, um, this, is, this is sort of separate whether I'm right or wrong, but, but Nora Catelli has, has made some really good arguments that say basically people hate being dehumanized. You know, I probably would much rather a Trump supporter think of me as you know, as an, an immoral jerk, than as not human at all. So in that regard, it's somewhat good news. Your enemies don't think of you as vermin; they just hate your guts. <laughs> all right, uh, Tristan. Oh no, sorry, Tristan just gave asked a question. Clearly, you can think of me as less because uh, uh, I'm having you're, trouble. You're like a bad robot. <laughs> words you know, I can't read, uh, Melton. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the great talk. I'm curious about your uh, thoughts about the developmental story behind this. So do we start out thinking or focusing on others as people as we're treating them badly? For example, middle school, high school bullies who pick on people and really sometimes do things that would be considered dehumanization. Are they treating those kids as people and then as they grow up, these bullies or other people then add on other ways of dehumanizing. So when they're adults, they can dehumanize in these all horrible ways. But like initially, um, are they more considering people as people rather than um, animalistic or mechanistic? Or is it the other way around? Those are some first thing, nice to see you again. Um, those those are, are really neat questions. In some way, so, so my own take on this is that in a psychological sense of dehumanization, nobody, dehumanization is actually pretty rare in everyday life. We treat people in ways that are in fact dehumanizing, like people don't deserve to be treated that way. And that's just sort of, that's not a psychological answer it's just saying you shouldn't treat people in certain ways. But when a bully torments somebody, I don't think they actually think this person they're tormenting is less than human. I think what they're thinking is they're really thinking this is a person here and I'm gonna make them cry. And by doing so, I'm gonna assert my dominance over them and so on. Now, the more general developmental story is, is, is a really cool one. And actually, you know, Emily and I have, have been looking at dehumanize, where you find dehumanization in young children. Um, I think the default is to see people as people. I think the capacity, and here I agree with people like Smith, the capacity to deny others humanity, to shut it off, probably is a mature and late acquisition with some difficulty. Thank you. Sarah? Hi. 
Hi, um, this is kind of going off of Tristan's question, sort of. Um, I was wondering if you think that in a way, like identity politics or just discussion about identity and grouping people into different um, groups based on whatever identity, whether that be sexual identity or yeah. gender identity or racial identity, if that could be an act of dehumanization because it's in a way like withholding some like withholding someone the, their power of expressing their full humanness which is break great identities and like push past um the bounds that you confine yourself to and i do you think that, that would be like an act of dehumanization in a way so to categorize somebody as a jew or a woman or somebody i think of them in some way would be dehumanization do you think in part because you're taking away from their individuality and focusing on their group properties. Would that be the idea? Sort of, yeah. But kind of beyond individuality, more like instead of the word individuality, rather seeing them as like a human, all not individual, but connected. You know what I mean? It's interesting. I could see sorry. some, sorry, um, I could see some sorry, sort of group, I could see some sort of group memberships being memberships in groups where the groups are sort of thought of in some way that denies the humanity of the group. Um, and I think certainly some attitudes towards African-Americans fall into that category where you might think you're a member of a group that's not fully human. For the most part, I don't think, um, I don't think attributing group attribution has that problem. Um, I'm now a U of T professor. If you see me as a U of T professor, I don't think it does any damage to me or any sort of dehumanization because falling into social groups is of course what people do. We're, we're social beings, we're groupy beings and that's sort of part and parcel of the whole thing. But I agree with you that there are certain cases where that could happen. Thank you. Okay, uh, we've got uh, Juliana now who I think is gonna defend dehumanization Good. convincingly. <laughs> I am so glad I came to this talk, Paul. That was fascinating. I haven't heard you talk about this for a while. I actually literally last week in this group gave a talk on what so I was calling I was a, everyday dehumanization. <laughs> I heard it was a great talk. Um, okay, so let me start by saying that I agree with you on a lot of pieces of this. This dehumanization literature is like, to put it lightly, a mess like the term is being used in every single way at this point I loved Harriet's paper in the sense that it was trying to be more precise and I think there's a lot of like terms that are being conflated now with dehumanization like you know just negative valence like just does, does hating someone is that the same as dehumanizing them no um and you know whether or not the person has good or bad intentions so there's a lot of conflation there I thought she was very much using sort of like a straw man argument which is that why, and here's kind of the question for you. Uh, well, two questions for you, if you don't mind. But one sure. is why would dehumanization as a construct um, not be considered on a spectrum? Like most, you know, it's not necessarily the case that, you know, so this maybe the strong version I think she was putting forth for the dehumanization hypothesis is that, you know, outgroup members are seen as completely non human, yeah. as opposed to a relative comparison that they, are afforded fewer sort of human-like characteristics compared to in-group members, right? It's a comparison. Um, yeah. And so, you know, if you, if you really seriously consider it as sort of a spectrum, then you could end up saying things like, you know, if you define, dehum one of the ways in which dehumanization is defined is as perceptions of sophisticated mental capacities. And so even just a tiny bit, you know, reduced perception of mental capacity could be seen as a form of dehumanization. Now, the term is so morally loaded that it does like end up sounding really ridiculous, especially to lay audiences to be like, yeah, you see a job candidate as slightly less thoughtful. That's sort of like a form of dehumanization. And so I totally hear you on that. And I, it seems to me like there's something like just in sort of like the moral loading of the term. It's like the term evil. Like it's like a little yeah. weird to say like, 
they see them as slightly more evil. <laughs> um, and so I, I wonder what you think about that. It's like dehumanization as sort of psychologists, including myself, as sort of seen it as a spectrum. And that doesn't really comport with like lay per people's understanding yeah. of it or, you know, as because it's so morally loaded. And then the second kind of follow up on that would be there's been a push in the literature to try to basically at the very least um, come up with sort of these different ways of describing different forms of dehumanization. So you could like, you know, Adam Waits and I wrote an article that, you know, none of it stuck, but basically it was sort of like dehumanization by commission versus omission, sort of like this more subtle form of dehumanization versus a more blatant form. And Nora Catelli is working on like a review article as well as making some sort of similar point where it's like trying to at least start to kind of differentiate these different forms. And I'm also curious to kind of get your your viewpoint on that. So I'll just let you respond to those things. Those are great points. Um, this may disappoint, but I agree with both of them entirely. <laughs> David Livingston Smith has, has a very sort of, very specific, extremely strong notion of dehumanization. He may be right that that exists, but if it exists in a strong form, why can't it exist in a weak form? You know, if I, if I think of people, if, if, if some people think of others as, as apes, not as people, but as apes, Surely it should be possible to think of people as somewhat as apes. These things would have to admit of a continuum. And so, so insisting that dehumanization only refers to extreme casing is mistaken. And I do think it's fully possible you could dehumanize in multiple ways. You know, so people, there's a lot of different taxonomies out here. Um, so I think that I, there's, no, there's no disagreement there. I guess my worry but, is- But sorry, that, just to like, so you sure. use the word like, you use true dehumanization like multiple times in your- Yes. You know, and so, and so <laughs> do you think that there's sort of like a true form versus a, a, a fake form or like, how do you think about that? Well, maybe an analogy would be, I could talk about narcissism and true narcissism. And narcissism doesn't have to be an extreme narcissist, could be somebody who's a little bit narcissist. But, but what makes it an interesting claim is you wouldn't describe somebody who has poor math skills as, well, that's narcissism. It captures a notion, that's a continuous notion, but it doesn't capture everything. And so my criticism about this is, I totally agree. I, I don't think it's, it's insulating yourself from falsifiability to say this is a graded notion, nor, and it makes total sense to see as, as having different types. But and here, I'll, I'll let you respond. I'll say, I'll say my say and I'll, I'll let you respond, which is, which is, I would worry if it got to be so broad that it included everything. So I say, say my colleague is short-tempered and you say, well, you're dehumanizing him. And I say, I think Trump is kind of a narcissist. Well, you're dehumanizing him. If everything negative about another person would fall under the rubric of dehumanization, then the word dehumanization just means to think bad stuff about. And, and, and it loses its utility. So in some way, it's a compromise position I'm suggesting. I wouldn't limit dehumanization only to extreme cases. I would allow it to be everyday dehumanization, but I would insist that, that it can't include everything. And for instance, it can't include me thinking that, um, that one of my undergraduates is irresponsible or another one isn't quite getting the material quick enough. If that's dehumanization, everything's dehumanization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't think dehumanization has typically been, been defined as simply negative, right? It's sort of lack of, of perceiving mental capacities, which often can be negative. Um, but, but, let me, but let me ask you, suppose I think somebody is not so smart. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's, that's dehumanization? Yeah, if you think of dehumanization as a spectrum, that would be a little okay. bit, right? Like relative. Okay. If, if so you then, define that okay. way. Now, now, one way out of this would be to call that something else, like sort of weak forms shouldn't be using the term dehumanization, um, which I think is interesting, but. I guess my own thought is it, it does distort the meaning of dehumanization yeah. to apply to someone who's not so smart because not so smart people are, you know, 50% of the world is less than, you know, on the bottom half of intelligence, but also it takes away the excitement of dehumanization research program. Because then if, if not being smart, if being hot temp, hot temper, being narcissistic, that's all that makes you less than human, then, then it just means bad stuff. Yeah, I agree with you on that. 
Okay. So, and I and, and I agree with you that 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 it would not be intellectually fair to restrict dehumanization as an interesting notion to a narrow and extreme class. It does make sense that there are more than one type, and it emits a gradation. Gradation. Good. Compromise. <laughs> Uh, all right. Um, there are a few more questions. I mean, that seems like a pretty reasonable place to end as we've had some kind of like theoretical synthesis though. Um, and just, just one minute early. Um, and Paul, Paul was just saying that he has nothing else to do. He didn't say this, but I'm inferring it um, other than reply to, to questions that folks have asked. Um, so if you are interested in being Paul's grad student, his postdoc, or perhaps and philanthropic benefactor. <laughs> okay, then a fourth. And have a question for Paul about uh, men against fire or anything about dehumanization. Um, then then you can email Paul. Paul is your email address. Um, still Yale, still Yale email until I get that worked out, and that'll still be for a long time. Paul dot bloom at Yale at edu. Okay, so feel free to to email Paul and uh, and get your question answered. Um, and thanks so much for to Paul thanks, and everybody. for all of you. And we will see you next week for the next talk in our summer series. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Stay safe.